Okay, good morning, everybody. He's not. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Is it coming through the mic? We're going to make a start. Thank you, everyone. Good morning. My name is Neve Fitzgerald, and I'm a professor of alcohol policy at the University of Stirling, and I also co-lead the UK PRP community of practice with my colleague, Professor Ruth Dundas from the University of Glasgow. On behalf of the community of practice, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to this prevention research conference. Um, I'd like to say a special welcome to our colleagues from UK PRP and to all our speakers and chairs who will be taking us through the discussion over the next couple of days. The UK Prevention Research Partnership was established by a group of UK research funders to fund research into prevention of non-communicable disease. And it was unique in focusing on drawing in new disciplines into prevention research, in emphasising working closely with policymakers, the public, and practitioners on prevention research, and on emphasising the need for solutions that work in the complex systems that drive NCDs. As well as funding research networks and consortia, a UK PRP funded the community of practice, and our remit was to bring together researchers from across the different topics and disciplines uh, to learn about the practice of doing large multidisciplinary research in this area. We established interest groups that I'll tell you a little bit more about later, and we've organised this conference over the next couple of days. As we move into the second phase of the community of practice, our remit is expanding to incorporate an invitation to prevention researchers who are not just from the UKPRP funded groups, but anyone who's interested in doing, using or learning from prevention research in the broadest sense. And we would like to invite you to become involved in the prevention research network as it continues over the next couple of years. We think that the groups and disciplines that come together through UKPRP, engineers, computer scientists, geographers, people from health backgrounds, and so on, focusing on topics as diverse as blue-green space, violence, mental health, housing, alcohol, tobacco, uh, is quite a unique space. We, we feel that there isn't a similar network or space in the UK currently that brings together such diverse groups of people who are involved in prevention research. And so I'd encourage you over the next couple of days to really make the most of the opportunities to talk to people that you wouldn't normally meet. But we're also interested in whether you would like to continue to have those opportunities through a new prevention research network. If you look on your badges, there's a QR code, and the QR code takes you to the conference website. It also takes you to the digital version, version of the conference handbook. But there is a link on there through which you can sign up to the mailing list for what has morphed from the community of practice into uh, a working title of the Prevention Research Network. We are now actually actively seeking new members for our interest groups that are focused on impact, on commercial interactions, and on collaborative research practices, as well as on system thinking and methods. Uh, we're looking for new leaders for our interest group on generating impact. And we're also looking for people interested in leading or being part of two new interest groups that have been suggested, one on public involvement and public engagement, and one on data governance. We're also open to ideas. If you think there's an area of interest to prevention researchers or research users that's not currently covered by the interest groups of the community of practice, please talk to us. Please talk to your colleagues, to your peers over the next couple of days, and see what level of interest there is, and do approach us. There is some coordination and funding support available through the community of practice, through my colleague Jack Martin, who many of you will have been in touch with, who's done a fantastic job in supporting the conference organization. Um, Jack is the research fellow that supports the community of practice and uh, can help with any of those interest groups. So please do catch me, Ruth, or Jack over the next couple of days if you'd like to discuss uh, joining a group or being part of it. Just a few practical notes then before I hand over. Uh, you also have information on your delegate badges on the parallel sessions that you've signed up to. Please attend the sessions that you have chosen because space is limited in the other rooms. I'd also like to remind you that the keynote presentations and the panel discussion later today are being recorded. Um, and I'd like to appeal to everyone to focus on staying on time in your inputs and brevity in your questions to help our chairs who have volunteered to lead the sessions. 
If you have any questions at all, please do pop to our registration desk at any stage. I want to wish you a really inspiring and interesting conference, and I would like to ask you to listen carefully and have a think over the next couple of days, because in your evaluation form, which is also linked through the QR code, you'll be asked to nominate what you think was the best session of the conference and who you think was the best speaker that you heard over the next couple of days. I hope that you have a great conference. I'll hand you over now to Dr. Catherine Moody, who's Head of Population Health Sciences at the Medical Research Council, who will provide a welcome on behalf of UKPRP. Thank you. Thank you, and good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Catherine Moody from the Medical Research Council. And on behalf of each of the 12 UKPRP funders, I'm delighted to echo Neve's warm welcome. It's so good to see you all here at UKPRP's first in-person conference and also to be here in Edinburgh. So I have a few introductory words to explain from the funder perspective how UKPRP came about and to remind us why this is such a groundbreaking initiative. Um, Many of you know already um, that we, fund, we established the UK Prevention Research Partnership in 2017 because we wanted to increase investment in prevention research across the UK. The vision of UK PRP remains to improve population health and to reduce, at the same time, reduce health inequalities through the primary prevention of non-communicable diseases. So we got together as funders because we realised that no single research funder could have all the resources or all the expertise to address these really complex factors and systems that influence population health. Um, we realised by joining forces, simple but effective, um, we could create a really powerful funding alliance, a partnership that includes major charities, a number of the UKRI, UK Research and Innovation Research Councils, and representation from government, health and social care departments right across the four nations of the UK. So in total, UKPRP is supported by £55 million of funding. As Neve said, we've had two funding calls, funded a mix of four networks and seven consortia, and the, the jewel in the crown now is the funding for the community of practice, which we're delighted to be supporting. It's enriching the partnership, and it's brought everyone here today with an agenda to champion what UKPRP is achieving as a group and to stimulate new conversations, as you heard earlier. So as UKPRP research builds momentum, it's particularly good that you're now widening out to the um, larger community. So I, I won't dwell on how we um, set up UKPRP to cut across traditional academic boundaries. I think you explained that very well. Um, and so we have a huge range of different types of expert in the room, which makes it really interesting if you're from a biomedical background like me. Um, we're probably far more used to this idea of cross-cutting now in 2023 than we were then. But at the time, it really was groundbreaking, and, and um, it, it's a pleasure to see how, how it's evolved. Um, the thing that um, joins everybody up is the intention to create systems-level changes, and some of you will be on different paths of that journey, but um, that's the intention. So um, many different types of expert here, and um, a common theme, though, to prevent non-communicable disease. And um, Neve's highlighted some of the topics that uh, you'll see around you on, on the poster boards and that are funded. So I, I won't sort of highlight those again. But what I do want to say is that now is really exciting time. Um, the outputs are starting to make an impact, and you're all part of that. And we're looking forward as funders to working with the community of practice to make sure that we disseminate results into policy making and into practice, because that's where this research effort need, needs to head. Um, 
We're really pleased that many representatives from the funders past and past and present members of the scientific advisory board are dipping in and out of this conference. And don't hesitate to come up and talk to any of us individually. If you've always been meaning to ask a funder a question, we're here, so make use of us. Uh, or we've got a stand in the exhibition area, and you'll find Catherine Dunn and Jane Strom from the Secretariat, who many of you will know there, and you come and talk to them and pick up a pen. <laughs> um, so... I want to say a word about the Scientific Advisory Board. Um, they provide strategic and scientific oversight for us, including monitoring the progress of your groups and providing support and advice. And I want to take this opportunity to express our deep thanks for their work, and also Professor Kevin Fenton, who's the chair, and Professor Rachel Luke Cooper, both for their leadership. They've, they've been pivotal in, in um, working with the SAB. SAB members are really very committed. You might not see that because it's sort of behind a closed door to you, but they really are. They're very passionate about UKPRP and they'll really enjoy the opportunity to interact with the researchers and, and share their pride in what's being achieved. So just before I close, I'd like also to say how great it is to see the support from the Scottish Government today. Um, this, as I've said, is echoed across the UK with our Welsh and Northern Irish funding partners also valuing the collective voice on, our pre on prevention research that UKPRP brings. So finally, before handing back to Neve, Ruth and the team, um, the funders want to say that we think the community of practice have done a fantastic job in putting together this conference and we're looking forward to the days. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. I'm delighted now to have the opportunity to introduce Jenny Minto, who is the Minister for Public Health and Women's Health of the Scottish Government, who will give our opening address today. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm delighted to be here as well. And thank you for choosing Edinburgh as your first venue for this, what I think is going to be a really helpful and informative and positive um, event. Um, I was speaking earlier to Neve and saying that um, not long after I was elected, I was involved in a piece of work looking at how different communities um, survived COVID um, and communities that specifically owned assets and how they perhaps had a different journey from communities that didn't. And what was so positive about that work was because it was a group of people from different backgrounds, with different experiences. And what I thought was lovely as well was they were being led by someone from the creative world as well. So not your normal project manager, but somebody that thought about things differently. Um, now, I'm an accountant. I used to work at the BBC, and um, I took great joy in being able to work with programme makers to try and ensure that they could put what they wanted to on the screens or on the radio airwaves. And I think, given the mix that you've highlighted that's going to be in attendance here, I think we could come out, come out as a result with some fantastic, really workable aims to support prevention um, across the United Kingdom. So thank you very much. As um, Minister for Public Health and Women's Health, one of my key aims is prevention. And I want to help create the environment where Scots can make better choices in order to live longer, healthier lives. It's clear that non-communicable diseases, NCDs, and health inequalities play a major role in stopping us achieve this aim. I'm sure we can all agree that we face major challenges in preventing NCDs across Scotland and continue to feel the effects of this. And in particular, the health harming products that pay a, play a key part in this. NCDs such as cancer, diabetes, heart and lung disease and stroke continue to be the leading cause of wholly preventable premature death and disability in Scotland. <clears throat> And a report by the NCD Alliance found that, sadly, in 2021, nearly 53,000 deaths were caused by NCDs. Now, given that we're in Edinburgh, I'll use the quote, 53,000. That's more than the capacity of Hibbs's football ground, Easter Road, and Tyne Castle's uh, ground, uh, sorry, Hearts' ground, Tyne Castle. That's a huge amount of people. The British Heart Foundation <clears throat> estimates that around one in five of these deaths were directly related to alcohol, tobacco and obesity. 
It also remains a sadly and unwelcome reality that ingrained health inequalities mean that communities experience health, quality of life and even life expectancy very differently across our society. And I've attended a number of events recently and seen firsthand some of the great work that's already happening in Scotland to tackle these. I've also been really encouraged when speaking to people at these events and I know there is a huge appetite to collectively move prevention agenda forward. But I also recognise that more can be done and importantly needs to be done. The Scottish Government remains absolutely committed to our public health agenda as well as the range of priority actions that we've already set out in relation to various health harming products including tobacco, alcohol and less healthy food. In September, we published our ambitious programme for government, which I believe contains several important actions and reaffirms our commitment to preventing ill health and tackling NCDs by building on existing policies that have shown positive impacts. For example, we know that alcohol consumption increases the risk of developing NCDs, including several cancers and heart disease. And in June, Public Health Scotland published their first report in the evaluation of minimum unit pricing for alcohol in Scotland. The report estimated that MUP had saved hundreds of lives and likely to have averted hundreds of alcohol attributable hospital admissions and is having a positive effect in our most deprived areas. As the First Minister set out in this year's programme for government, we recently published our report on the first five years of MUP alongside a consultation on the future of the policy with the proposal to increase the current rate from 50 pence per unit to 65. This proposed increase is expected to not only maintain the benefits that have currently been identified, but would also likely achieve greater public health benefits, including prevent preventing hospital admissions and saving lives. This, along with the other actions set out in this year's PFG, are initial critical steps, but we also must remain focused on planning to deliver longer-term improvements to population health through preventative measures. For example, the prevention of NCDs and the prevention specifically of cancer are closely linked. This is reflected in our new and ambitious Cancer Strategy and Cancer Action Plan for Scotland that was published in June this year. It outlines 11 ambitions and 8 outcomes. The ideal idea is to prevent those cancers that are preventable in the first place. And we've got uh, quite a, a large marketing uh, campaign just now um, called, in, called Catch, Catching the Early Bird. So um, I commend that to people um, in the room and check it out on your pharmacies as you go past. Reducing risk factors to help prevent cancer is one of our key ambitions and my hope is that public health interventions will mean more cancers are prevented. We also know that it's the most valuable and sorry, the most vulnerable in society that suffer the greatest impacts from health related issues. And I think it's important to acknowledge the work being undertaken across government on this to continue to deliver support to our most fragile communities. And that was one of the discussions I was having earlier with Neve, uh, Ruth and um, Jack. Yes, excellent. <laughs> Faces are great, names sometimes, sometimes fall apart. But the, the, the importance of understanding um, what is going on in our fragile communities and actually the, what, what is, what's contained in them and what, what uh, attract people that live in them. So that was something that I very much um, took on board. For example, our £9 million Investing in Communities Fund prioritises key areas tackling poverty and inequality, including child poverty and community-led regeneration. And last year, we invested £3 billion in programmes targeted at low-income households, with £1.25 billion direct directly benefiting children. And we've also increased the Scottish Child Payment by 150% to £25 per child per week and expanded its reach to all eligible children under the age of 16. We are focusing our resources on tackling poverty, where we can and building the foundations necessary for future generations to thrive and as a minister in the Scottish Government we also have very strong connections between my fellow ministers as well and we have got things that work we work together on a cross portfolio um, basis so we all have poverty and um, eradicating it as part of our responsibilities no matter which element of government we sit in. 
Building a healthier nation requires the concerted efforts of all of government and, not, and it is not the sole responsibility of health social care services. As I mentioned during my introduction, health harming products continue to have big influences on NCDs. For example, the food environment is often skewed towards the promotion of less healthy food and drink, encouraging extra spend and higher calorie intake. That's why on our recent visit to a school breakfast club, it was great to see the excitement of the children that they had over making healthier choices. I think most people went for the strawberries, which I quite understand. Um, but there was also whole wheat cereal um, and toast. One child told me she didn't like the cereal, but her friends did. As a result, she cleaned her plate. So a wee bit of peer pressure, perhaps, but definitely children supporting each other through these new food experiences. This is a public health priority to ensure that Scotland is a place where children eat well, have a healthy weight and are physically active. And uh, this weekend, I'm actually going to a girls' football tournament um, at Oakle View uh, in Stenhouse Muir to see some of that in action, which I'm really quite excited about. I hope, um, a lot I was saying um, to Kirsten when we were coming in the car, the first time I was there, I'm an Aberdeen supporter, and Aberdeen got beaten 2-0 by Stenhouse Muir in the Cup, and I have never lived that down. So um, I'm, I'm interested to see what happens uh, on Sunday. The public... Uh, this is a public health priority, yes. It's also these kind of choices that I want to see us make at all stages of life. And if we start with the youngest, making it part of everyday life, we can make a real difference for generations to come. While normalising health choices, we want to denormalise unhealthy choices. For example, Scotland has a range of world-leading tobacco control measures, and we were the first country in the UK to introduce a ban on smoking in indoor places in March 2006. And I can remember arriving at Waterloo Station in London, being greeted by a wall of cigarette smoke and being quite shocked and surprised. What a change that legislation made on how we now live. And as a result, smoking rates are at an all-time low. In fact, a trading standards officer told me that in order to undertake a test purchase for tobacco, they had to describe in full detail cigarettes, brands, numbers, everything. And that was because the young person who was going into the shops wasn't able to. It's amazing to think that in less than a generation we have made that change, but there is still so much to do. And I've been clear that I want to go further than what has already been achieved. Indeed, our aim is to create a generation of young people who do not smoke. I am committed to doing what I can to reduce smoking, rate, smoking rates in our communities to 5% or less by 2034. Our programme for government included a commitment to taking action to reduce vaping amongst non-smokers and young people, and we welcome the opportunity to take part in the recent UK-wide consultation on creating a smoke-free generation and tackling youth vaping. We will also soon be publishing our refreshed tobacco action plan, and this will lay out our roadmap to how we are going to reach the 2034 target, and I look forward to being able to share this with everyone soon. Internationally, uh, physical inactivity is recognised as one of the four leading modifiable risk factors for NCDs. Conversely, we know that physical activity can play a vital role in the prevention, early intervention and management of many NCDs and long-term conditions. For example, a recent study by Public Health Scotland showed that in 2019 we lost over 4,500 years of full health across our population due to the impact of physical inactivity. Um, on heart disease alone. And I was thinking that basically takes us back to the Stone Age, which is quite a distance back. That's why encouraging and supporting people to, in Scotland to be more active more often is a policy priority for the Scottish Government. In line with the WHO target, we aim to reduce levels of physical inactivity in adults by 15% by 2030. It will be very challenging to reach that goal, but our most um, recent national surveys show that we are making progress and we will continue to follow international best practice in developing our approach in Scotland. Sadly, though, we know for some people it's too late for prevention and there's a need for treatment. Today, on World Diabetes Day, we can recognise the steps we have taken, but also those we still need to. Type 2 diabetes is a great example of how both prevention and treatment can work so well together. NHS boards are delivering effective evidence-based options for those at risk of type 2 diabetes and those diagnosed through our type 2 diabetes prevention framework. We are also committed to legislation to res risk restrict the promotion of less healthy food and drink. 
where they are sold to the public. This can better support people to make healthier choices in line with our public health priority to create a Scotland where everyone eats well and has a healthy weight. Finally, I would like to draw your attention to the Chief Medical Officer's recent annual report, which I believe clearly states, sets out the four population health challenges we face both now and in the future. We know that threats from infectious diseases remain, life expectancy is stalling and health inequalities are widening. Demand for and utilisation of our health and social care services continues to increase in an unsustainable way. The climate emergency requires adaption and is already affecting Scotland's health and well-being. I'm sure the Chief Medical Officer would agree with me when I say how vital it is that these should not just be words on a page. Instead, they should be visible in and tangible actions over the coming months and years as we all work towards a healthier Scotland for all. We need to work across boundaries and set out a common approach to the recovery and long-term reform of the NHS and improve the health of our nation to meet the needs of our diverse population. And I know opportunities such as this conference are perfect examples of how we can work together and create a healthier Scotland together. So thank you all again for allowing me to speak to you today and I hope you all have a very productive enjoyable and innovative conference working together. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. I think we've all been uh, really delighted to see the innovation from the Scottish Government over the years, and certainly many of the measures have been taken up then by, by other nations and other places, so please keep up the good work. Um, I'm going to move on now and introduce our keynote speaker for this morning. Our keynote speaker is Professor Sandro Galea. Sandro is a physician, an epidemiologist and an author. He's Dean and Robert A. Knox Professor at Boston University School of Public Health. And he's previously held academic and leadership positions at Columbia University, the University of Michigan and the New York Academy of Medicine. Uh, he's come a long way across the Atlantic to speak to us today, and I'm really interested to hear what you have to say, Sandro, and really grateful to you for making the time. Thank you very much. Very good. Well, uh, good morning. It's really a, um, an honor to be here with you today. Thank you, Dr. Fitzgerald, for, the, um, for inviting me, for the kind introduction, and thank you all for being here. Um, we are, it's exciting to be here at the, um, at the first in-person meeting of uh, the um, UKPRP. And I, um, when I was asked to speak, I, I was thinking a little bit and discussing with the organizers what I should speak about. I'm talking to an audience of experts. You all know as much as I do about prevention. Um, uh, so the question becomes, in this moment in time when prevention is more visible than ever, and at a time when I think there's more potential for the work we do to actually have penetrance than ever, really, um, and of course that time is a time post-COVID, it seems to me that it's a time for self-reflection. So what I want to do in my 40 minutes, 45 minutes of address, and then we'll do Q&A, is give us some grounding. I want to go back a little bit, talk a little bit about basics, and then provoke us and offer a challenge about where we stand at this time post-COVID. And I, and I do that from a place of deep respect for the work that we all do in public health, the work we all do in prevention, but to say to us, it is time for us to reflect on what we do well, what we don't do well, so that we can do ever better. So that's my thesis. That's actually where I'm going to go. And I'm going to talk pretty quickly because there's an audience of, uh, of uh, very accomplished people, and, I, and they'll also give us more time for questions. I'll start with this. What causes health? I know it's boring. You're all like, ah, we all do health. We all know what causes health. But sometimes it helps to take a refresher. And uh, I, um, I would like to, um, I, by the way, I should say that uh, I'm using a lot of American examples. Forgive me, but I would never presume to use UK examples. You're experts here, and I would be at a loss if I tried to uh, compete on expertise in, uh, on your home ground. So my examples are American. Um, um, what is health? 
Pelt is embodied in this picture. This picture is Blind Willie Johnson. He uh, is uh, one of the fathers of the blues. Um, um, he was born sighted in Texas at the turn of the 20th century, around 1900. He grew up poor in Texas at the time. Um, um, he became blind in a domestic violence incident at age seven. He learned to play the guitar, made a living busking in street corners, not a very good living as you can imagine. Uh, got married, him and his house were living in a small, uh, his wife were living in a small house which burned down at one point, but they had no money, so when the house sort of finished burning, they went back and were living in the burnt out shell of the house. That was his life. Um, in his early 40s, he developed malaria. This is Texas in the US, it's a southern US state. Malaria was not uncommon in the 1940s in Texas. His wife took him to hospital for treatment for his malaria and he was turned away. And then he died. Now, the reason I tell that story is to ask the question, what killed Blind Willie Johnson? Well, what killed him was malaria. But I tell that story because we all realize it wasn't just malaria, right? It was homelessness, it was poverty, it was racism, it was domestic violence, it was limited access to care. And that, to my mind, captures what we all do in public health, what we all do in prevention. Because our job is, yes, to make sure everybody has treatment of malaria, but also that we tend to domestic violence and homelessness and poverty and racism. And we all understand it, and I think sometimes it's helpful to remind ourselves of that because we realize both the importance of what we focus on and also the magnitude of the task. So number one, that's what's, what causes health. Number two, a bit more, even more obvious, what is health? Now, you know, we, we, we all dwell in health on a day-to-day -day basis, and, uh, but it, it, sometimes it's easy to forget what we're actually trying to get at. This is the classic definition of health that we all know about from the Constitution of the World Health Organization, which is the complete uh, physical, mental, and social well-being. It is a highly ambitious definition and one that is easy to lose sight of. It's easy to lose sight of that if we focus only on one dimension of health, for example, the absence of malaria. One could argue that Blind Will Johnson was not healthy even before he did not have malaria, even though I did not mention any other traditional morbidities. You know, I often feel about health that it's uh, a little bit like uh, the old definition of something else, which is uh, hard to define it, but you know it when you see it. We all know roughly what we have in mind by health, um, and it is our job to aspire to that. I often use the term that uh, health is uh, not a destination, it's an aspiration, and I think that's okay. I think it's okay for us to have a radical vision for the kind of world we want to build where everybody can live in absence, of, in absence of, of factors that keep them away from mental, social, or physical well-being. And then one other aspect of health that, to my mind, is inextricable from any discussion on health is equity in health. Health equity is essential to everything we do, and we often define what we do in terms of health, but we need to remember that there is no health until everybody's healthy. There's no health unless we narrow health gaps. This is a definition of health equity from a paper a group did, um, uh, health equity is the allocation of resources according to need in a way that preventable differences in health outcomes are minimized. There's a lot in that definition because it, it links health explicitly to resources. And it says that one cannot have health without thinking about resources. Now that, that, if you stop and think about it, is actually quite provocative because it says to achieve health, we also need to grapple with resources and assets, which is something you already heard, heard a little bit about in the introduction today. So first, what causes health? Second, what is health? Now, how are we doing on health? One of the problems with inviting someone like me to um, do the keynote, as I said, I'm honored to, to have been invited, is that you, you, know, you sort of invite me to, to, to talk doom and gloom because that's sort of is my stock in trade. Um, um, so I just want to take a step back and say, we're doing great on health. I know, I, I know what you're thinking when I say that you almost like get a shudder down your spine saying, how could he say that, the apostate? Um, uh, I say that, because if you were to choose to live any time in the history of the world on health, you should choose today. This is health today's life expectancy from 1770 to 2021. You see this enormous inflection in life expectancy about 150 years ago. 150 years ago, everybody in this room could expect to live till age 40. I would ask for a show of hands, how many of you would have changed your life, life decisions if you knew that? For example, how many of you would have done less schooling had you, had you known that? It is an enormous, it is an enormous transformation. Of course, we all recognize the challenges we're facing to health, and I'm going to talk about those in a second. But I think it's important to remember that in the arc of time, we are actually doing very well on health. Of course, tying health back into health equity, when I say we are doing very well on health, I'm taking a very narrow lens. So I take a narrow lens that comes from the country where I happen to live in and the country where we are presenting right now, which is a high-income country perspective, which elides enormous differences in health. There are, there's a 30-year life expectancy gap, for example, 
between where we're sitting here today and Nigeria. And you know, I'm often asked when I speak to lay audiences, what's the one thing I should do to make sure I'm healthiest? Well, the one thing you should do to make sure you're healthiest in your life is to make sure that you are actually born in a high income country to well off parents. And if you can choose that successfully, your path is set. That is of course not how the world should be. And it is on us consistently to keep that in mind. You know, conversely on this, I show child mortality, which sort of shows the inverse of that with enormous variability in child mortality. So on health, we're doing better than we have ever have done, but by we, that we is very heterogeneous. Now, what drives how we're doing on health? Well, I go back to the Blind Willie Johnson example. You know, Blind Willie Johnson, I told you a story using a, a, uh, a person, a historical personage, that can, is reflected equally well here. This is an infographic from the Institute for Clinical Systems Improvement. This says the exact same story as the Blind Willie Johnson story, only now it shows it in a more familiar sort of a health speak, where it shows that, uh, you know, healthcare contributes some, some to health, 10, 20%. Health behaviors, which you heard about from the minister, physical environments, and socioeconomic factors, education, job status, et cetera. We all know that. We all know that that's fundamentally um, uh, where you are um, uh, on health. By the way, I see people take pictures. You're welcome to take pictures. And the slides are also wide available. I'm happy to give the slides to anybody who wants them afterwards. Um, uh, of course, that reminds us how much uncertainty, um, how much unevenness there is in access to those same resources that generate health. Um, uh, this looks at global income and wealth. Just focus on wealth for a second. This is the red bar is the top 10% of uh, um, wealth holders in the world. And we hold about 76% of the world's wealth. That's we. And I mean we, I mean people, you all here in the UK, me happen to live in the US. We hold 80, about 80% 80 of the world's wealth. That is directly linked to some of those global inequities that I showed you earlier, which should, should, if we're thinking about it, make us feel uncomfortable, should make us squirm in our seats, because there's no reason why actually that is fair, going back to the definition of health equity. And of course, the other thing is that really hasn't changed much at all over time. This actually looks at distribution of income um, uh, over, over time in the world and uh, how much income is held by the poorest fifty percent of the world. That's that. Really has stayed roughly the same. You see this poorest state 50%, middle 40%, richest 1%. It has stayed the same for the past 40, 50 years. Um, um, you know, so assets, maldistributed, that drives health. Healthcare spending. Um, uh, drive some health. This looks at uh, healthcare spending. These are high-income countries. That's the U.S., which is a, 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 a gross outlier in healthcare spending. And this is healthcare expenditure share of GDP. Leaving aside the U.S. being an outlier, these are um, sort of Western European countries and look and tremendously more healthcare spending than other low-income countries. And of course, um, less spending on assets on all the other forces that drives health. So point five. Oh, by the way, in case you're wondering, I have 13 points. For those of you who are like, you know, those of you who are not liking my talk, you can sort of roll your eyes and say, ah, only seven points to go. Um, um, the, uh, a key point, it's not about just some of us, because one of the challenges I think we have in prevention, scholarship, prevention, action, and in public health is, you know, we, we, we resonate with the idea that there should be no health gaps. We resonate with the idea that there should be no health left behind. But, there is some, something in our minds that says, you know, I'm a good person. I don't want people to be held left behind, but thank the good Lord that that's not me because I'm looking after myself. And, you know, I think it's important that we actually recognize that actually having health not be as good as we want it to be, having health gaps affects everybody. I want to show you an American example. Again, I said I'm showing you American examples. You all know the UK examples. Um, I like this quote. This is the problems of any of us are the problems of all of us. Um, uh, in the U.S., you all know that the U.S. is riven by a lot of uh, health inequities. You all know that. I, I realize, having um, European roots, that it's easy to make fun of the U.S. of the U.S. when you're in Europe. Um, uh, and uh, I, I, I get that. That's okay. Um, um, the um, this is a U.S. Uh, um, life expectancy through the spectrum of income compared to to English life expectancy. And what you see is that the U.S. is actually worse off than uh, England life expectancy at every part, every point in uh, the income spectrum. Um, uh, one point which I used to, to make this point, and I am sure that you can actually make these same points using UK data, by the way, is this. One of the ways in which the US health is terrible is on maternal mortality. We have about, about really five-fold maternal mortality compared to other high-income countries. This is US as a whole. Now, when you look at that, and when I present the data in the US, people in our community sort of cringe a little bit and say, yes, well, that's driven largely by mortality among black women, which is entirely the case. So then you can take those data and restrict them only to privileged white women 
in the 1% richest neighborhoods in the US, and what you get is that, where that maternal mortality is still twice as high as it is in other high-income countries. So among the most privileged in America, you still have twice as high um, uh, maternal mortality than you have um, uh, in other high-income countries, which, gives, which really illustrates the point that when you have health inequities, it leaves, it not only leaves some behind, it pulls everybody back. And I think that's critical to any argument that we make in public health going forward. Okay, so that's the first part of my talk. Now I'm going to sort of inflect a little bit because having made those foundational points, as I said at the beginning, we are now at this extraordinary time when there is more visibility for prevention, more visibility for public health than there ever has been before. And that is, in large part, due to COVID. Now, I put on the slide what we learned from COVID-19, I put on the, the red background here, because I know that when I speak about COVID, this is where you all pull back in your seats and say, dear God, please don't talk about COVID, because we don't want to talk about COVID. I understand that, I also don't, also don't want to talk about COVID, but COVID was such an enormous tragedy. It was hopefully the biggest tragedy on the health of populations that any of us in this room are going to live through in our life, that I think it does the tragedy at the service if we don't learn from COVID. So I think it is an important moment as we emerge from the acute phase of COVID to say, what should we learn from COVID? And what do we learn from COVID to the end of advancing a prevention and public health agenda? So now with the grounding of what is health, grounding of what drives health, I wanna to shift to what actually happened in COVID. Well, first of all, COVID was a big deal for these reasons. It resulted in about seven and a half million people dying worldwide, probably an underestimate. It resulted in this global inflection in life expectancy, essentially taking us back about 10, 15 years in life expectancy. Globally in the US, it took us back about 20 years. And it became, in most high-income countries, the third leading cause of death right there after heart disease and cancer in 2020 and 2021. I would like to remind us that in December of 2019, none of us had ever heard the words, could word COVID. And if I were to sit today to tell you that in 2025, there is going to be some disease that is, has a name that you have never heard of today, that is going to become the leading cause of death in 2025, that would make you either run for the hills or make you say, how can we use all the budget of the UK PRP to prevent that from happening? That's exactly what happened in COVID, right? Came out of nowhere, became the third leading cause of death, which makes it a really big deal. And that really big deal affected health of many, affected health of populations, and affected health unevenly. It reflected the underlying patterns of inequity that I talked about before, in, in really in all countries. So I'll show you the US example. This is um, um, the drop in life expectancy in the US. I just wanna focus on this purple line here, which is indigenous Americans, um, where there was a six year life expectancy drop for Native Americans. Six year life expectancy drop um, during the course of COVID is unprecedented. In, uh, <coughs> just to ground it for a second, um, in during World War II, young American men sent off to war in World War II, they had about a three to four year life expectancy drop. Six year life expectancy drop is truly off the charts that uh, none of us had seen before. So COVID was a really big deal. Seven, so why did COVID happen? COVID was a virus, I understand that it was a virus that crossed over that we had not really been exposed to before, but the consequences of COVID, the consequences of COVID happened for three very specific reasons. They happened because of underlying structural inequities, pre-existing poor health, and disinvestment, and what could have helped. Again, I'm gonna lean on American examples for this. You can all figure out how that applies to the UK example. I wanna talk about each of them, and I wanna talk about how each of them actually predisposed us to what happened during COVID and became the crisis that COVID was. Let me talk about underlying structural inequities. So we know that there are inequities in how society is built. Much of the time, we sort of accept that. And in health, while we know that that's actually a cause of health, we don't tend to think about the direct impact it has on health. So let me show you one direct impact, how underlying structural inequities became what happened in COVID. COVID comes about, it is a new, scary, terrifying infectious disease. Infectious diseases spread from person to person. And we say to each other, well, how do we stop a disease from spreading from person to person? Well, we shouldn't be in contact person to person, right? So we say everybody who can should work from home. Agreed? That's what we did, right? Now, before COVID, we actually knew who could work from home. These are 2019 data, pre-COVID data. 
These are data from Bureau of Labor Statistics that show among people in the top 25% of income, a majority, 62%, could work from home. Under that, the bottom 75% of income, only a minority of people could work from home. Therefore, when a new infectious disease outbreak happens and we say to society, if you can work from home, you can work from home, that statement is inter can be interpreted in two ways. Number one, it's a prudent way to minimize spread of infectious disease. Or number two, it's a way to make sure that people who make less income are more likely to acquire infectious disease than those who make more income. So let me just now make us all really uncomfortable, if I may. Is okay? Just once, then I'll, then I'll go nice again. Um, um, raise your hand if you work from home at least part of the time during acute COVID. Okay, now, put your head down. Raise your hand if when you worked from home, you never, never got anything delivered to you. <laughs> One person, two people. For the rest of us, can somebody explain to me why it was okay for our risk to go to be reduced while poor people delivered stuff for us? We can discuss that later. If somebody has an explanation why that was okay, please let me know. Okay. So what was the implication of those structural inequities? Here's what the implication was, that the people who died in COVID were construction workers, manufacturing workers, cashiers, childcare workers, laborers, machinists, etc. Those are the people who died, and those people died specifically as a result of the actions that we took. In the US context, those people are disproportionately people of color, particularly black Americans, because black Americans are disproportionately represented in grocery store workers, public transit workers, trucking, etc., etc. So the structural inequity directly became what happened during COVID. That's point A. Point B, pre-existing poor health. We knew right from the early days of COVID that COVID was a disease that was mostly a problem for people with underlying poor health. These are data from the China CDC in February of 2020, before COVID had hit the UK, before COVID had hit the US. And we knew that um, if you had uh, underlying cardiovascular disease, diabetes, coronary respiratory disease, you're much more likely to die of COVID. Of course, when we had underlying poor health and that underlying poor health being unevenly distributed, for example, this is black Americans versus white Americans. Black Americans are in blue, white Americans are in red. Higher in young ages, middle ages, older ages, high blood pressure, diabetes. That became directly the pattern of black Americans dying more in the US than did white Americans. So number one was structural inequities. Number two was underlying poor health. And number three is disinvestment in what mattered. This is what our picture was in the US in terms of our funding of state and local public health workforce before COVID, and you see all of that was going down. So that's really what drove what happened in COVID. Yes, it was a new disease. Yes, it took us by surprise, but if we could grapple with underlying structural inequities, pre-existing poor health, and investment in some of the things that actually could help us, we actually could have avoided millions of deaths worldwide. Now. Let's talk about what public health should learn from COVID-19. Because of course, we make a compelling argument about structural inequities, we care about pre-existing poor health, and we're rah-rah all for people investing more in what we do. So that's fine, but I think one of our challenges is that we can say, well, it's all about them, it's those who invest, those who are responsible for structural inequity. So now let's talk about what is it that we should learn. Well, first of all, what's been happening since COVID-19? What's been happening is trust in, in health has been going down. These are, um, these are, again, US data. You see also these numbers going down. They're stratified in the US by our sort of red and blue parties. Um, but you see that things are going down um, uh, uh, consistently. Even more alarmingly, trust in health is particularly down among Gen Zers. This is uh, um, people who say they have a lot of trust. People who say not at all trust. You see Gen Zers, very, very, very low. So the boomers are the ones who are uh, most trusting. Now, of course, that could be in part the cynicism of the young age. That's fine. I appreciate that. Um, uh, but it doesn't bode well for us if um, trust in health and health experts is actually so low among young generation. And then you can all see it. You can all see the loss of trust. And I want to show you an example of this loss of trust in health from uh, a, uh, post, a um, sign that was put up outside my favorite bakery in my neighborhood where I live in Massachusetts in the US. This is a clear flower bakery, outstanding bakery. I re highly recommend it. Um, um, this is a sign that they posted, which is, while we know indoor mask mandate has been lifted in Brookline, that's the community where I live, we will continue to require a mask to shop until further notice. Now, at some level, that notice is innocuous, right? Let me take you back to 2019. Can you imagine any bakery in 2019 putting up a sign on its door that said, while we know that implicitly the experts say 
you don't need to do X for health. We insist that you do X for health because we, the bakery, don't trust what the experts say. Can you remember ever seeing a sign like that before COVID? That, to me, is a problem. So now we turn to the uncomfortable part of the talk. So this is um, a quote which I really like. This is Judith Butler on the right, is a feminist icon. She said, the matters most in need of public discussion, the ones that most urgently need to be discussed, are those that are difficult to discuss within the frameworks now available to us. So I would like to discuss some things that are, I think, urgently should be discussed, but are difficult to discuss, with gratitude to the organizers for inviting me and giving me license to do so, even if they did not know I was doing so. <laughs> um, uh, so I will start by um, talk about sort of how did we, I explained what was, what, why COVID happened, the structural inequities underlying poor health and disinvestment. All of that is true, okay? But I would like to now turn a mirror to ourselves. I would like to turn a mirror to ourselves. And I do that. I do that from a place of deep love and respect for the work that we do and challenging us to think and try to be better. I don't expect that you'll all agree with what I'm saying, but hopefully it'll give you something to think about so you can shape your own ideas about how we can be better as a public health prevention community going forward. And I would argue that there were three shortcomings of the public health community. False certitude, contradiction without acknowledgement, and intolerance of disagreement. Let me just talk about each of them very quickly. I'll start with false certitude. You know, once COVID hit, we found ourselves as a community in the spotlight like never before. And we... Um, threw ourselves in. We, uh, you know, we threw ourselves into the spotlight and we made prediction after prediction about uh, COVID, essentially all of which ended up being wrong over and over and over again. You know, to our credit, we didn't give up. We kept being wrong over and over again. <laughs> um, uh, and, you know, these things, I know, and then these things uh, sort of played out in the UK as well. And uh, they, you know, they resulted in headlines that eventually said, you know, I roll at all those public health people. Um, There's a quote which I quite like, with a lot at stake, it's wise to be humble when faced with fundamental limitations. I ask us how humble we were. Dynamic models are usable as long as they take into account the uncertainty of the assumptions on which they are based and the data they are led by. If this is not the case, the results are on a par with assumptions or guesses. This is from a scientific paper. We actually know that the results of dynamic models without knowing the assumptions are on a par with assumptions or guesses. Of course, that's not how we approach things, as we approach things from a place of certitude. Now, when, in, when we defend ourselves on that, we say, well, the people can't handle complexity. The people can't handle, um, uh, you know, sort of a bit of echoes of a uh, you know, few good men, the movie, you can't handle the truth. The people can't handle the truth. And that's roughly what we said. But that's actually not true. The people can actually handle complexity. This is actually just leading on science. Results show that whereas people do perceive greater uncertainty when it's communicated, we observed only small degrees in trust uh, in numbers and trustworthiness of the source. People can handle uncertainty. And we did, not, we did not give them the respect of actually giving them uncertainty. So number one was false certitude. Number two, contradiction without acknowledgement. We did the thing that everybody who has children knows you can never do with children, which is you contradict yourself without actually telling them that you did. No, we actually did things like this. At first we said you don't need a mask. Then we said we changed our mind. And by the way, just so we don't confuse you, little people, we have removed all evidence that we actually previously said that, um, uh, confusing everybody. Um, so we contradict ourselves without actually having the humility and grace to say why we contradict ourselves. And number three, we were intolerant of disagreement. We actually had a uh, orthodox view in public health of how we should handle COVID, and we did not allow dissension within our ranks, again, on the assumption that people cannot handle this agreement. Perhaps this, the apotheosis of this was in the Great Barrington Declaration, which came out, which essentially um, uh, was offering alternate paths to COVID at a time of a lot of fear in the summer of 2020. This is the Union of Concerned Scientists commenting on uh, the Great Barrington Declaration. They called it herding people to slaughter, a dangerous fringe theory. Now, it was a theory that actually came out from some of the most elite universities in the world, but perhaps they are fringe. Um, uh, what that fringe theory said was adopting measures to protect the vulnerable should be central aim. By way of example, nursing homes should use staff with acquired immunity. Staff rotation should be minimized. Retired people should have their groceries, other essentials delivered, et cetera, et cetera. If you read it, you will see that actually much of what was said was entirely rational and eminently reasonable. There were some things that are debatable. In no way was this a fringe theory that was hurting people to slaughter. And that, of course, then translated into intolerance of things, of debates around schools closing, school opening. This is in Philadelphia. When school reopening was called, we should, we should not have to teach students to death, which, of course, we weren't doing no such thing. So why did we fall short? 
Why did we fall short? Why did we make these mistakes? We, I, have, I have deep confidence and belief in the well-meaning, good intentions of all of us in public health. We choose to do this, recognizing that the work of public health is most successful when it's most invisible, not because we want to self-aggrandize. I realize that. We do it for all the right reasons. So then why did we fall short? And I think there are three reasons why we fell short. Our systems are complex. We have biases that we don't often acknowledge and groupthink. So let me talk about each of them. I'll start with complexity of systems. I could talk about complexity of systems in many ways, but perhaps the most obvious way to talk about it is to talk about sort of the challenges we had with schools and schools opening, schools not opening. There were key, there were real differences across the Atlantic and this differences across the European continent. Um, uh, but we do know consistently across all high-income country schools that kids fell behind enormously. This is kids falling behind in, uh, in math. These are uh, different grades. And what you see is the curve shifts to the left. The blue curve is, is COVID era. The pink curve is non-COVID era with everybody's scores going um, uh, shifting to the left. Um, in particular, kids who are in uh, minority schools fell behind. And broadly speaking, um, most observers now feel that we've lost about six months of uh, schooling attainment. And uh, again, it's uh, st uh, students of color faring worse than students in majority groups. Schools in more affluent areas were faster to reopen than those in low-income communities. And of course, we know, we know that um, there is nothing more important for long-term life, li long-term health across the life course than education. This looks at mortality and different groups. And what you see here is this by education. If you go from left to right, more education, lower mortality in any group. So by holding back kids' schooling, we have now consigned a generation to potentially poor health. It is then not a surprise that there have been, this is a protest in, uh, in London, um, uh, that there have actually been this uh, deep unease in the public about uh, school closures and how we deal with that. Deep unease in the public, the public senses that this is a really complex issue. And we, in public health, have a responsibility to respect complexity and acknowledge it as such. So number one, issues are complex. Number two, our biases. We bring biases to the table. That is, that is how it is. That's OK. And we, we, we're never going to be unbiased. But we need to be honest about our biases. I want to show you perhaps what is, the, to my mind, the biggest identity-based bias in the US political system. This is the American Congress, and this is the country. The blue is the percent of people who have a four-year college degree, essentially have a university degree. This is in Congress, and this is in the country. So what you see is almost everybody in our elected officials has a university degree, Well, about 35%, about 40% of Americans have a college degree. I, I don't know numbers in the UK, but I suspect they're similar. Now, you can say, well, it's probably OK. It's probably good that our elected representatives right, are educated, yes. But the elected representatives being educated means that everybody they know actually can work from home, which then makes policymaking quite different when everybody you know can be like us, raising our hands, saying, I work from home a little bit. So this is a real structural bias in how decisions are made, and we are part of that. You know, the academic, public health, practice, media, political spaces, we're all occupying the same space. I mean, you had the minister here in the room. Like, this is, this is we're, we're occupying that space, and this is a space which brings with it its biases. Again. I'm not saying we shouldn't have biases. I'm saying that we need to be aware of those biases. We also occupy a space where we are all left of center politically. This is, uh, this is our uh, academics, professor, associate assistant. You see, essentially, everybody is center or left of center. About 10% of uh, professors are actually right of center. You know the only um, industry which is actually more left of center than, uh, than universities? The media. The media has only about 6% of people over here, while the university is about 10% of people. We have to remember that uh, the reason there's a center is because 50% are to the right of it, 50% of people to the left of it. So the fact that we're all occupying one side of it makes it pretty crowded on the left and uh, pretty exclusive of people who are actually on the right. Um, um, and we also have to remember that uh, we, all, we all have positions where actually we might have approached something like COVID different than everybody else because we did better than everybody else. This looks at... Um, um, this is 2020, and uh, this looks on multiple dimensions, mental health, personal finances, job security, take-home pay, physical health, personal life, work-life balance. Above the line means you're doing better. Below the line means you did worse. Everybody's doing worse except for this group. You see this group right here? That's the group with postgraduate education. So postgraduate education group, bring on COVID. Um, uh, so why am I saying this? I'm, you know, I, I, realize, I realize I'm being a bit glib about it, but I do, I'm trying to sort of show us 
high level observations that really make the point that we, as a public health community, were complicit in not thinking about things right. That yes, what drove COVID was structural inequities, underlying poor health and disinvestment of what we do. But we have part of the responsibility. And since I am talking to us today, I wanted to focus on what it is that we can do better. And of course, we don't really represent the population that uh, we serve. This is epidemiologists in a, in a worldwide survey showing epidemiologists are, this is the proportion of epidemiologists who are actually people of color, which is a significant minority, fa vastly underrepresenting the population we serve. And the third point is groupthink that we developed sort of groupthink that allowed us to do things like this, like argue for zero COVID, zero COVID, which as you know, was uh, actually the lead editorial of uh, the two leading UK medical journals, both had editorials arguing for zero COVID. This was not a fringe theory. This resulted in, by the way, the zero COVID policies in China, that, uh, which was based on, on, uh, on that scientific thinking, which resulted in untold numbers of that. Zero COVID was always a spherical cow type assumption. It was never something that actually could work. You know, you know the, old, the old spherical cow joke, which is, you know, the scientists who were brought in to investigate cows who are no longer producing milk, and the scientists do a panel, and after six months of deliberation, they say, let us assume a spherical cow. And of course, there's no such thing, which means we have only eliminated one disease ever. We're never going to eliminate zero COVID, and it was a mistake of groupthink that then empowered autocrats to do things that they should or not have done. So as I conclude, a way forward. Now let me end on the positive. So what is a within reason way forward? And I argue for three things, humility, compassion, and reform through reason. Let me start with epistemic humility. Um, what do I mean by that? You know, it was difficult to be, hum to be humble during COVID because all of a sudden people in this room, were, you were rock stars. This is uh, the New York Times kept running these pieces. What epidemiologists are doing for Thanksgiving? What epidemiologists are doing for Christmas? Who cares what epidemiologists are doing for Thanksgiving? Um, epidemiologists, you know, I'm an epidemiologist. They're really like a really boring bunch. Um, um, the, uh, but you know, that goes to your head. Um, uh, the opposite of epistemic humility is epistemic arrogance, tendency to overestimate our ability to predict when we're overconfident in our knowledge. And I say this so that we are very clear that we do not do that. Number two, radical compassion. What does radical compassion mean? It means that if we're gonna make a statement that says, work from home if you can, we pause and say, who are we killing by doing that? Because this is what happens when you say work from home. This is in the US, share population staying at home. The um, red line is the poorest 20%. The, the gray line is the richest 20%. You declare a national emergency. These are people working from home. And you see this exactly what happens, exactly what one could have predicted. And compassion to recognize that there are many causes of death and that people who might be invisible to us, things that we may not be scared of, might be killing more people than the things we're scared of. This is a drug overdose epidemic in the US. Let me give you one data point which I suspect you've never heard. In the United States during 2020, 21 and 22, the three years of acute COVID, more people died from drug overdose than died from COVID under the age of 65. That was the US. The attention we paid to one versus the other, I will let you draw inference from that. Radical compassion makes us say, what? is actually affecting the people's health. And what is affecting people's health that I may not see, that I may not be scared of myself. And finally, reform through reason, being able to keep data in mind. This is, um, looks at a mortality rate in children ages five to uh, 14 during COVID. That's death from COVID, that's death from transport accidents, cancer, suicide, homicide, heart disease, et cetera. That is uh, what data should inform us. You know, I've written on this in sort of different ways. I've written about this notion of um, radical incrementalism, that we need to have a radical vision for health, as I said at the beginning, uh, to have the wisdom and the humility to take the incremental data-informed steps to get there. I will end with this. You know, I've always seen public health as the paradigmatic liberal project. Um, uh, this is uh, the, the um, Black Plague in Europe, which killed a fully a third of, of uh, uh, Europeans at the time. This is the 14th century. I'll you know, point out masks, and we really haven't advanced that much in 600 years. Um, but um, the, um, um, you know, what this resulted is, it was a terrible, terrible um, uh, um, plague, but it also resulted in a lot of social changes. For example, the uh, dissolution of the feudal system resulted from the Black Plague. Why? Because there were fewer people to work um, anymore, so as a result, it was much harder to actually maintain feudal systems. It also resulted in a flourishing of intellectual thought, um, uh, which led fundamentally to the Enlightenment. Now, enlightenment thinking is really rests on the power of reason or the rights of individuals, progressive improvement of societies, 
and the fact that the natural world follows orders that can be documented by data. That resulted in sort of what we call now liberal thinking. Now, liberal thinking, I don't mean this partisan, I don't mean this as, sort of a, as, a, as a link specifically in the UK, either to the Labour Party or anything like that. I mean liberal, willing to respect, accept behavior opinions different from one's own and being socially progressive. I think all of that we can do, but it's on us to actually make all of that happen. You know, there's been a resurgence of uh, interest in liberal things. This is actually from uh, Google's uh, Ngram viewer. There's been a tremendous drop, and now we're actually seeing more and more of it. But of course, public health and prevention has always been the paradigmatic liberal project. From the work of uh, John Snow in, uh, in uh, thinking about cholera, it was a classic liberal project, to the work of Ignaz Semmelweis, thinking about hand washing and documenting hand washing um, um, as something which really was perhaps the most Im influential preventive effort in the world. Of course, Ignaz Semmelweis in his time was ignored, spent, was, uh, was actually kicked out of the hospital where he, did the, where he did the studies showing that hand washing saved lives, and he died a pauper in what at the time was called an insane asylum. So, so much for that. But nonetheless, his efforts were exactly right. So I will close with this. Um, uh, I will close with a uh, quote from a colleague, which is uh, this, which is initially it seems silly, then it seems controversial, then it seems progressive, then it seems obvious. And uh, I, uh, I would argue that I realize that I've, I've uh, proposed a lot of ideas. I realize that some of them may seem silly, and I realize some of them may be controversial, but my intention was to give you food for thought. Food for thought as you go on to do the work that you do, because I have a firm belief that the more of us think about these things, the more we'll actually get to better and better place. If anybody's interested in, uh, this is um, a blog that I do roughly weekly called The Healthiest Goldfish, and it's a book that I have coming out um, uh, this month, which is some of these ideas. The URL on the left takes you to the blog, um, and that to the right takes you to the book. Thank you for having me. I'll take questions and challenges. Thank you so much. Definitely food for thought, and we have time for questions. Uh, so I am going to have a look to see if there's any hands. First, would anybody like to kick us off? Over here, thank you. That's an excellent question. Nobody's ever asked me that. What do I think is a silly idea? Well, I, I, I do think that um, the idea, I mean, there, there are many of them, but I'll just focus on one. The, the idea that we can tackle an epidemic of the scale of COVID in a way that does not widen health gaps right now feels like out of hand, silly. But I think we can do it. I actually think that we should have learned enough during COVID that we can guide the world to that. So I, I, I would like to and I go back to my notion, I think we should have a radical vision for health. I think a radical vision should be that we can narrow health gaps, we can reduce health gaps. But to do that, we need to be clear about what drives them and our role in driving them. So I think that's silly, seems silly right now, seems so outlandish, but I do think we can get there. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Um, those, I think I'm correct in saying that most of them have a law degree or a finance degree. Um, how important is it, do you think, um, the, the factor of place that the people yeah. that make policy decisions don't actually understand what we know? Yeah, well, the data I was showing wasn't specific law of finance, it was simply having a university degree. I actually don't know what proportion have um, <coughs> law of finance. Very high yeah, law. yeah, I'm sure that's right. Um, um, I do think it's important. I do think it's important that there are um, that the people's representatives actually understand the challenges that face the people. I do think it's a it is a problem that uh, you know if we say within health, right? I go back to my blind Willie Johnson example to say, okay, let's say we agree with that. To say, but therefore, you need sectors like housing sectors that deal with uh, domestic violence, sectors that need with access, with, with, with access to resources. You need all of those to align with health. Well, if people leaving those sectors don't understand health, it's not part of their remit, it's going to be harder for us. So I do think that we and the world would benefit by having elected representatives who actually understand these issues. Now, I'm often asked by our students, you know, by leading a school, I have a lot of students who say to me, well, then is what I should do run for office? And my answer is, 
we do need more people in, who are office holders, but if whether you should run for office depends on whether or not your particular skill set and your particular aptitudes lend themselves to be effective in office. I would rather have somebody in office who actually was not formally trained in health, but who is sympathetic to the ideas of health because they're smart and thoughtful and wise than the converse. Thank you. Can I also just reach out to our colleagues who are in the upper gallery? If you'd like to ask a question and you're listening through in the upper gallery, if you can make your way through into the main room and we'll get you then. Petra. Hi, I'm, I'm really interested in the idea of radical incrementalism and how you turn that into, into practice in situations where, you know, both, both policymakers and, and also our funders are usually interested in new and shiny ideas, you know, sort of challenges, solutions, whatnot. So quite often, You've got, you know, you're just getting somewhere and then you get defunded and you've got to scramble around to sort of try to continue your work almost despite the system. I don't know whether that is the same in, uh, in, in, in your particular context, but just, just some reflection on that, um, yeah. you know, the, 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 the new and shiny versus the, the radical incrementalism and how we might be able to turn that into a reality. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the new and shiny problem is a real problem. Um, uh, I, uh, I agree. And, uh, and, and, and it requires persistence on the part of um, those of us in health to make sure that uh, the funders do not lose you know, sight of the prize, so to speak. Um, it, you know, I'm constantly challenged when, uh, you know, in, when I'm invited to speak to non-health audiences. You know, what they really want to know about is about the shiny. They don't want to hear about any of this stuff. And I think it requires real persistence. Now, in terms of the incrementalism to tie it to that, you know, what I mean by incrementalism is doing the hard work to maintain the things that matter on the forefront of the agenda. And that requires people of, you know, resilient, good conscience to keep, to keep at it and to keep doing it over and over and over again. You know, I think the challenge to radical incrementalism as an approach is when does one say, well, everything's so broken that what we need to do is blow it all up anyway and you know, chuck it all, and anything incremental is, is sort of complicit with a flawed system. And I'm, I'm, I'm sympathetic to that argument. Um, um, I, I, I think, in, as a, the more I think about it, the more I write about it, it is um, that approach is such an approach of last resort because it hurts so many people and costs so many lives in the process that one should embrace it judiciously, that history teaches that um, progress happens incrementally through people who are, who are persistent in advancing the things that need to be advanced. So I suppose, I don't really, I'm not really giving you an answer other than to give you encouragement to keep doing what you're doing. Thank you. Can I ask, Sandro, uh, how do we rebuild that trust in public health? And I think in a, in a way, I'm, you were sort of saying that this is our opportunity as public health, there's never been greater spotlight. I'm not sure we feel that in the UK. Mm -hmm. I think we feel like there's a fatigue, actually, with yeah. the ideas of public health. Could you say a little bit on, yeah. on those topics? No, no, I actually think both are true. I actually think there is enormous fatigue. I think there is, um, there, there was this moment of opportunity, and now there's fatigue. And I'm hoping that it'll be sort of, you know, a uh, backlash to the backlash that will sort of come back where people say public health really matters. Um, you know, I think we rebuild trust. I mean, I suppose I could have retitled my talk you know, how we rebuild trust in public health, because it's really what I was getting at, right? I was really getting at the, at the fact that, uh, that people are not going to trust us if they feel like we are, we don't have the right humil humility to approach problems, that we are actually not seeing what people are seeing as their problem, and that's how we rebuild trust. You know, when, when vaccines, 2021, when vaccines, the, the whole world was focused on how do we get vaccines to everybody? I was inundated with media calls who would say, how do we get people to trust us to take vaccines? To which my answer consistently was, you actually don't. In 2021, there's nothing you can do about it because trust is built over time. Trust is built over decades. You know, it's the old aphorism. If you, t if you have to say to someone, trust me, you've already lost their trust, right? It's a trust has to be built and earned over time. So I do think that we are at a moment in time when there is this enormous fatigue. I think the fatigue comes from COVID and from how public health reacted to COVID. And now is the time for us collectively to start saying, what do we need to rebuild? For example, does anybody in this room disagree with the statement that clearly our approach to communication and public health is utterly broken? 
Now, I say this from a place of, I run a school of public health where we teach public health communication. Like I have a strong certificate in public health communication which I could sell you. And I'm telling you that everything we teach in a certificate is nonsense. But why? Because we know it's nonsense. Because look, when, when we needed it, we clearly did not communicate successfully. So it is a time for us to say, what, what does that look like? What does rethinking that look like? I, I, I'm not sure. I actually don't know what public health communication looks like, but there are people in this room who are much smarter about these topics than I am. And I suppose my challenge is, let us together have the humility to say, let's rethink these things so that we can actually get to a place where people trust us. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you. Julie, would you like to introduce yourself first? Uh, colleagues, people would definitely resonate with a lot of the things that you've said. Um, we're going through a rather brutal public inquiry, um, which I suspect isn't going to achieve anything like the clarity that you've um, described, probably quite the opposite. So I'm interested in how you think those, you know, what, how do we have those conversations in a way that people feel um, able to reflect and think differently when we are in a bit of a a blame space. Yeah, no, it's an it's an excellent question, and you know one of the um, you know one of the hesitations I have in in, in even um, sort of trying to turn him on us in public health is this notion is there's plenty of people willing to sort of you know cast blame, and uh, you know should we as our own family um, uh, look at our own mistakes, and I you know in balance I come to yes we should, but I think one can. One can do that without blame. I think one can do that from a place of respect for the efforts of good, well-intentioned people. Um, I think one can do that from a place of uh, mercy that recognizes that mistakes have been made and we should learn from them and move on from them. And um, I'm not sure if others are going to have the, uh, you know, give us the grace to do that. So I think we should do it ourselves. I mean, I tried to do it in uh, my book that, just, that I mentioned. I, I'm not naming names, and, 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 and I'm, I'm trying to get us to look at concepts and uh, to say, what can we learn, and how do we learn to get better? I think one can do that from a place of, um, of genuine commitment to the aspirations of a field. One can do that from a place of, uh, of a big tent embrace of people in the field who can bring different perspectives but, and have the arguments without being either disagreeable or without um, being castigating. But I, I think we should model that. I don't know enough about the public inquiry, but I can imagine just from, uh, you know, what you're in between lines, we can talk about it in the, over coffee. Um, um, but uh, I, I, uh, I suppose I'm, I'm suggesting that we should hold ourselves to a higher standard than others hold us to. And I think we should model the thoughtfulness that goes with that higher standard, including in how we reassess what we have done. You talked a lot about uh, the need to acknowledge uncertainty and complexity, and I just wondered if you could reflect a bit on how we do that without risking that that's used as a, a sort of weapon against action, and then it's, sort of, it's all yeah. too complicated. Let's let's do nothing. Yeah, no, it's, it's it's also an excellent question. I um, I think it is possible to to hold two contradictory truths at the same time, which is that. Um, more data are needed, we do not know enough about X, but we have enough data to act on X. And, uh, and I think it's on us to make that point. I mean, I'll, I'll use one concrete example, sometimes it's easier to concretize this. I'll use the example of, uh, you all know that uh, one of the challenges the US faces in health is firearms. And uh, we have about more people die from guns in the US every year than people die from motor vehicle accidents. And you know, with the challenge that's put against, you know, there's this cash 22 that's imposed on health, which is to say, well, there has been not enough research. Of course, there's not been research because it hasn't been funded. Therefore, we don't know enough to act. And you know, I think many of us have tried with some success to make the argument, yes, we don't know enough because there's been a 25 year gap in our research on the area, but we do know enough to do some things. And, and I think being, consistent in communicating that is the challenge. I think our mistake is when we go one way or another, where we either say, no, 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 we know everything there is to know to act, that's where we get to false certitude, or conversely, we don't know anything, therefore we can't do anything. And you know, so I suppose I am prescribing for us a tricky space to occupy, I realize that. But I think that tricky space is called the real world and we should occupy the real world. 
Any last chance for questions? Yes, thank you. Yeah, so I guess I was wondering how much of this is institutionally ingrained in public health currently, and for that reason, how feasible do you think the suggestions you've made are, and how easy to shift, basically? Um, how much of it is ingrained? All of it very deeply. Number two, how easy is it to shift? <laughs> I don't know, <laughs> but, <laughs> but that's why I'm here. Um, um, the... Um, you know, perhaps I go back to the quote, you know, perhaps it seems silly if you ask question. What might be silly? Well, I think it's silly to believe that we can actually get to these ideas and grapple with them, but I have, uh, I'm, I'm going to lean into hope and to say, yeah, there are, the, the, the field of public health and prevention is uh, populated with smart, well-intentioned people who want to do right by the world. And I believe that smart, well-intentioned people want to do right by the world. Um, uh, will find the humility to actually change the paradigms if those paradigms are not working. And I'm not, you know, as I said at the beginning, I don't know that everything I've said, even I'm not sure I agree with everything I said, that's okay. Um, uh, but um, my firm belief is that uh, by giving the space for airing of difficult ideas, we will get to a better place. Thank you for having me. It's really a privilege to be with you. Thank you. Thank you so much again, Sandra. That was really fascinating. And I think just a real challenge to us all as we go through the next couple of days to really think about what can we do differently in talking to people that we don't normally get to speak to and in working together. I was really struck by you know, how lots of the problems that are sort of classic public health, the drive ill health, are actually uh, dealt with by people who might not think of themselves as working in public health. And I think that's, that's something for us to really think about as we go forward. Um, it just uh, leaves for me to just guide you to your next session. So if you are going to the oral presentations uh, on environment, pollution, and secondhand smoke, you stay here. If you're going to the symposium on commercial interactions, you go to my left here into the upper gallery. And if you're going to the workshop on engaging communities with prevention research, please head back upstairs where you will be directed. Thank you again to all our speakers this morning. Thank you.